There's still one more subject that we need to cover in order to complete our lengthy discussion on Paul and the law, and that has to do with the function of the law. Now at this point, permit me to remind you that it's easy to be confused because earlier in our discussion we talked about three different types of law. This has to do with the distinction that the Reformed camp often makes in this discussion. And now we're going to talk about the three functions of the law. And so please be careful not to confuse these two things uh, together. So we're talking now about the function, the ongoing role that the law might play. And classically, uh, three different uh, functions have been uh, identified. The first is generally called the civil use. This is the idea that uh, even for non-Christians, if the law of God were put into practice within culture and society, what would happen? Well, something positive would result because sin or evil would be held back. It would be restrained. And this is the so-called civil use of the law. And then secondly, there is the teaching use, sometimes the Greek word elenchus, the idea of refuting or rebuking, but it's the idea that the law teaches us something important about ourselves, namely that we are sinners, that we are people who disobey God's will for our lives. And we'll say something more about this in a minute. And then the third use uh, is the idea that the law is a guide for holy living. How can Christians... Um, uh, express their gratitude to God for what God has done for them in Christ, well, the law tells us how we can please God, right? So we can express our thanksgiving and gratitude to God by being His people, by doing His will, by obeying His law. And that third function is typically called the third use of the law, the idea that the law is a guide for holy living. Now just to show you that this threefold distinction is indeed a historic one that goes back in the history of the church and especially is a big part of the Reformed faith, I have a couple of quotes here. I don't want to take time to read them, but you can see here if you did stop the tape and read the text in detail, you can see that Calvin talks about the first part, second part, and third part of the law. What's he talking about? He's talking about these three different functions that we have just been introduced to. He changes the order a little bit, but you can see also the second function here, uh, restraining sin in humanity in general. And then the third, and what he calls principal use, and indeed the third use has been most closely identified with the thought of Calvin, and that is, as he says, um, that, that Christians, right, uh, this shows them how they can please God. It becomes a guide for holy living. But it's not, uh, this threefold or three types of functions aren't limited just to Calvinists. You can see here in the Book of Concord, the doctrinal standard of the Lutheran Church, it too has these one, two, three functions or purposes of the law identified. You can also see it, of course, in uh, Uncle Louis, as I like to refer him, uh, right? Louis Burkhoff is a former president of Calvin Theological Seminary and wrote a systematic theology that is still widely used in seminaries around the world today. And you can see he, too, has these three uses or three types that we've already mentioned so far. Now, what I'd like to do, though, is I'd like for you to think of the function of the law a little bit differently. In other words, I'm going to package them. It's not so at odds with these three functions. It's just more nuanced than that. And I'm going to suggest that it's helpful for us to think of the ongoing function of the law in two ways. That it has a negative function with regard to sin and a positive function with regard to the Christian life. Now, the first one, the negative function, I only call it negative because somehow there are texts where the law and sin are linked together. And uh, when that happens, it's usually not a positive experience for believers. Although we'll see that ultimately it leads to a positive goal. But that's why I call it a negative function, because the law is somehow connected negatively with sin. I'm going to give three subtypes of this negative function. And then after that, then we'll talk to about the so-called positive use of the law, which overlaps exactly with uh, Calvin's and uh, Reform's classic third use of the law. So if you will, uh, join me for a few moments. Let's think more carefully about what I've called the negative function of the law, those texts where law and sin are intimately linked together. So there's some kind of connection between the two.
And actually, my comments stem from an article that I published a number of years ago against the view of Heike Reisinen. You may remember from your reading that Heike Reisinen uh, is associated with the so-called contradictory approach to Paul and the Law. And this is the thesis. He wasn't the first to originate it, although he developed it in a very powerful way. Uh, I sometimes say, right, he, 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 has a really, he does a really, really good job developing a really, really bad thesis. And his thesis is that we can't solve the differing and seemingly contradictory nature of Paul's statements on the law. And we can't solve them because Paul was inherently confused on this matter. Anyway, um, what Reisinen does is he takes in one chapter of his book, those texts, as I said, where Paul links uh, law and sin together. And Reisinen says that, well, Paul refers to this connection between law and sin differently. So different that he uses this argument to support the idea that Paul contradicts himself. And so in this article, I reevaluated uh, those texts and said that, uh, well, yes, there are differing functions, but uh, they're not so contradictory. In fact, they're somewhat complementary. And so uh, that's where these three subtypes, if you will, under the negative function of the law that I'm proposing comes from. I've got C words for them all, and maybe that will help us uh, remember uh, these different functions. So the first function can be called the cognitive function. The cognitive function because the law cognitively teaches us something about ourselves. Namely, the law teaches us that we are sinners. And there are two texts in particular where Paul links the law on sin in this teaching us of our sinfulness way, and that's Romans 3.20b and also Romans 7.7b. I have questions under Galatians 3.19 because there's some ambiguity about uh, exactly whether this text should fit under this understanding or not. Now, this comic actually is a good one because here's Homer Simpson and what's he doing? He's looking at a, well, he's looking at obviously a faulty mirror, right? When he looks into the mirror, he sees he sees not who he really is, he sees only the studly person that his mind thinks that he is. And this is a problem that humanity typically has. If, if I have the wrong mirror on which to make a value or judgment about my life, if I start looking around at people around me and say, well, you know, compared to other people, I'm a pretty good person, right? In fact, I'm a lot better than most people. Well, that might lead to a wrong conclusion about how I truly stand before God. But if I take the law of God now, right, this perfect law of God, which doesn't tell me how I think that I am, but tells me how I actually am, well, of course, it's not a happy thought because I look in the mirror and, well, I see, ah, I, I'm not the saint that I thought I was. I'm not the holy person that I imagined I would be, right? Because I see all kinds of ways in which my life, my conduct, my thinking, my action doesn't match up perfectly to God's will as we meet it in his law. And so the law cognitively teaches me about my sin. And this is an important point because even though it's not a happy thought, in other words, it's not a it's not something that I go, oh, yippee, I discovered that I'm a sinner. I've discovered that I'm not as holy and perfect as I thought I was. Even though it's not a happy experience to be taught your sinfulness, it nevertheless is a crucial experience. Because if you don't know that you have a problem, well, then you're not going to look for a solution to that problem. And if humanity has no awareness of its true problem, namely its sinfulness, well then it blindly keeps going in its ignorance and it doesn't turn to God and to Christ who alone can save us. And that's why I say this here, that, that the biggest problem in our contemporary world is not that people don't know about Jesus. The biggest problem is that people don't think that they need Jesus. Yes, I know there are some people in the world, right? People groups who do not know the gospel story and we need to tell them that. But there are a lot more people, I'm afraid, who do know the gospel story, at least in its broad strokes, but they ignore it. Why? Because they don't think that they need Jesus. It'd be like you running into the room and saying, I found a cure for thrombosis. And everybody kind of yawns and, and is bored. Why? Because they don't have thrombosis. And so they're not at all excited or interested in your solution. And so it's only when humanity becomes aware of their sin, even though that's a painful experience, but it positively forces them to look for a solution to that sin, which alone can be found in Christ.
I, I'm sad to, to have found this these ads uh, that um, started appearing by atheist groups in Europe. Uh, it first appeared in Italy, it also has appeared in England, but they took out ads on billboards and on buses and uh, they say this, the bad news is that God doesn't exist. The good news is you don't need him. And so again, here's an illustration of the fact that, that Humanity needs to be taught this painful truth that it is fundamentally flawed, right? That it is not able in its current state to be the people of God and to live the holy life to which he has called us. And the law teaches us that. That's what the Heidelberg Catechism says. It says at the beginning in the sin, salvation, service part, in the sin part, it says, how do you come to know your misery? And the answer is short. It says the law of God tells me. And you can see there uh, those two texts from Romans that can be justly cited in support. And so this is the first subtype under the negative function of the law, right? Negative function, some connection between law and sin. And the first subtype is the law cognitively teaches me about my sin and my misery. Well, there's a second thing that at least two texts that Paul has uh, refers to. So Paul connects the law and sin in at least two texts where the law seems to have a converting function. Converting function. Now be careful because if you don't pay attention, you'll hear the word converting and think somehow it has to do with somebody who's not a believer and the law is somehow work converting them, changing them, turning them into a believer. And that's not at all what I mean by the use of this term converting. What I mean is that the law comes along and takes sin, which is already sin, but once the law comes along, it takes sin and it makes it more sinful. Maybe that sounds funny, but it's the idea that, well, sin committed in ignorance of God's will for our lives is nevertheless still sin. But wait a minute, once God reveals himself, once people, so to say, know better, and then they continue to sin, well, that makes their sin more sinful. It's, it's a more direct affront to God and his authority. The two texts where this, I think, is at work is Romans 5.13 and also Romans 4.15. Because Paul, when you read these texts, seems to make a distinction between, well, the time when sin existed before the law came. Remember the law, the Mosaic law wasn't given till Mount Sinai, so obviously the fall had already happened, and so humanity was existing in a condition of sin. Then the law came, and wait a minute, now Paul is saying that sin after the law came is still sin, but now it's more sinful. Here's a text from one scholar, uh, Cranfield, from a few years ago that says, I think, exactly this point. He says, the law brings God's wrath upon men, it's gender specific because of the older date of this source. But the law brings God's wrath upon humans by turning their sin into what? Conscious transgression and therefore rendering it more exceedingly sinful. And Paul, contrary to Hakey Ryson, it is not contradictory when he says this. In fact, there is a good Old Testament antecedent for Paul making a distinction between, well, sin before the law came and then sin after the law came, after which, right, uh, that sin is more sinful. And I think a good example, a good Old Testament parallel can be found in Amos. I don't know how familiar you are with Amos, but he's the country boy. He's the country bumpkin. You do see him wearing suspenders, right? But yet God called the country boy to be a spokesman for him, a prophet. And he, even though he's from the south, he prophesied in the north, in the kingdom of Israel. And at the beginning of Amos's prophecy, he has, uh, he has a series of judgments against all the nations around Israel. And you can almost imagine Amos getting out preaching this sermon. And of course, the people in Israel like this sermon, especially at the beginning, because he's proclaiming judgment on all the nations around Israel, all their enemies, right? Uh, we hear about how God is going to punish them because they're sinful. But after six of these surrounding nations are condemned, then suddenly Amos begins to condemn the southern tribe, Judah. And then I can imagine Amos' hearers get a little quieter. I mean, we're a different 
group area, us Israel in the north, but yet they still are our people. They also are fellow Jews, children of Abraham. And then after the judgment on, his, on uh, Judah, then Amos finally turns his attention to his own hearers, to the audience in the northern kingdom of Israel. And here the judgment is longer and it's harsher than it is against all the other nations. Why? Well, I think a clue is found here in chapter 3. We read this, Hear this word the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your sins. Here God is saying that out of all the Am, um, out of all the people groups of the world, I entered into a covenant relationship with you. And that means that you have a privileged position. Out of all the nations, you know who I am, and you know how I've called you to live in this covenant relationship. And so that covenant relationship that Israel enjoys as a benefit, as a privilege, also, though, entails greater responsibilities. Israel can't say that they don't know better. They didn't know who God was or how God had called them to live. They are, in a sense, with less of an excuse and thereby under greater judgment. And so if Paul understood texts like this, namely that uh, Israel, the group to whom, the people group to whom God revealed his law, were, were held to not only a greater degree of blessing but also responsibility, well then I can imagine Paul could easily make the kind of statements he makes in Romans, those two texts, where he seems to distinguish between sin before the law came and sin after the law came. And that's that converting function. So the law comes along and converts. It changes sin into something that is more sinful. Well, there are still yet a couple more texts where Paul takes law and sin and links them together, and we have to somehow make sense of these too. Now, Hickey Rison had looked again at these and sees Paul's making differing statements and uses them as evidence that Paul is, again, contradictory. But again, things might be different, but maybe more complementary than contradictory. And there are a couple of texts where Paul seems to say that the law causes sin, right? The law comes along and arouses sin within its adherence. Now, I hesitate to use the word causative, because people might think, oh, then it's not human fault anymore, it's the law fault, right? We were doing perfectly fine until God came along and gave us this law, and this law caused us to sin, and so somehow we're off the hook, we're innocent. And so I wanted a different C word that might better minimize that danger, and so I came up with the idea of a catalytic function, a catalytic function. I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm an artsy fartsy, but what little I do know about science is that a catalyst well, it takes an action that's already there and that it either increases the speed of that action or the intensity of that action. And so I thought that the word catalytic might be a better analogy for us to think about this function of the law. It's not so much that the law created or caused sin where it didn't exist before. No, sin was already there existing within humans, but then the law becomes an occasion, a catalyst for sin to emerge. And uh, the biggest text or verses that seem to express this causative or maybe better catalytic function are these texts from Romans 7, verse 5 and a number of verses between 8 and 11. And an analogy here maybe might help. Analogies sometimes break down, but let's imagine that um, uh, some parents uh, have a son, uh, Johnny, who's you know maybe eight or nine or so. He's old enough uh, to leave at home by himself just while they go next door to visit their neighbors. And so they say, you know, Johnny, Mom and I are, are going to go next door, and we'll be back in just a few minutes, and if you need us, you know where to find us. Now, while we're gone, we don't want you to take any of those chocolate chip cookies we have in the closet. And Johnny kind of thinks for, and says to himself, I didn't know there were chocolate chip cookies in the closet. And so you see, the law, the commandment, don't take those chocolate chip cookies in the co cupboard, right? The, the law didn't, so to say, cause that sin. I mean, sin was already there, right, in that, that selfish, self-serving desire in the child. But then the law becomes an occasion, right, for sin to occur. Maybe that's an analogy to help us think then about the causative or better the catalytic function of the law.
Well, uh, remember that in this new, slightly revised schema, instead of the three functions, the civil, the teaching, and the third use of the law, I've taken, instead, I've talked about a negative function of the law, negative because somehow the law is connected with sin, and I've talked about three ways in which the law might negatively be linked with sin. The law cognitively teaches us that we're sinners. The law turns our sin, it converts our sin into something that's more exceedingly sinful. And the law, in some sense, is a catalyst. It becomes an occasion for dormant or latent sin to uh, arise and be empowered in sinful action. Now I move to what I call the positive use of the law, which overlaps with that distinction we've already met, namely the third use of the law. Remember this goes back to Calvin. He said it was the third and predominant use of the law, right? And so when he thinks about the law, this is the first and biggest way that he thinks that we should think about it. Um, you have here also the quote from Louis Burkhoff, which I think I'll take a second to read. He says, the Reformed, and although he doesn't spell this, the implied contrast is to Lutherans and maybe a few others, do full justice to the second use of the law, teaching that through the law comes a knowledge of sin, and that the law awakens the consciousness of their need for the redemption. But, here we go. They, that is, the Reformed believers, devote even more attention to the law in connection with the doctrine of sanctification. They, that is, Reformed Christians, stand strong in the conviction that believers are still under the law as what? As a rule of life and of gratitude. And hence the Catechism, right? The Heidelberg Catechism devotes not less than 11 Lord's Day to the discussion of the law, and that in its third part, which deals with gratitude. If you're familiar with the Heidelberg Catechism, it's sin, salvation, service uh, divi division. It's in the service part that the Ten Commandments, for example, are explained and treated. And that reflects then this third and predominant use of the law, namely as a guide for holy living. And there are a bunch of texts uh, where Paul presupposes or explicitly states that the law has an ongoing role in Christians lives. Romans 3 31. Romans 8 verse 4 I think is a very important text where Paul says that in the preceding verses he's been talking about the activity of God through the Spirit and through Christ and he says all of that redemptive activity happened. Why? For what purpose? In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. But there are other places Paul cites from the Decalogue in positive and affirming ways. We have references from 1 Corinthians about the ongoing nature of the law, and also in Paul's other letters, even letters where he has strong statements negatively about the law because of the specific historical context in Galatia in particular, right? But he has positive statements even in those letters too about the ongoing nature of the law in the Christian's life. And elsewhere in Scripture too, other biblical writers presuppose that Christians, followers of Jesus, will do, will obey, will fulfill the law. I have a chart here that may be helpful. Maybe it's not, but perhaps this will help summarize some of the things that we have talked about. And so what I have here is, uh, is two ends of the spectrum. So on one end, you should think of law existing, and on the other end, you have grace existing. So if you start at the wrong place, if you start with law and you try to get to grace through the law, Right? That would be called a legalistic or works righteous way of thinking. If you think that the law will allow you to score enough points that you will receive and experience God's grace, well then instead only negative things happen. Instead you will one, cognitively become aware of your sins. Two, you'll become more painfully aware that your sins are not just sin, but you recognize how exceedingly sinful they are. They're a direct affront to God and His authority and His call for us as Christians to live a particular way. And thirdly, you'll see the painful occasion that the law, instead of helping you with your sin, actually exacerbates your sin. It becomes almost an occasion for sin. So again, if you begin with law and you try to use law to get to grace, only bad things happen. You experience the negative functions of the law.
However, if you begin it the other way around, if you begin from a posture of God's grace, if you begin with Romans 8 verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, so Christians begin with a free and undeserved gift of God's grace made possible through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, then maybe you can see the law functioning in a more positive way. First of all, you can see there on the top, this would be the positive function or the classic third use of the law, you will say, oh, how can I say thank you to God? There are lots of ways to say thank you to God for His work of grace in Christ Jesus. You can do it through worship. You can do it through uh, singing. You can do it very personally and intimately through prayer. But yet another crucial way that Christians say thank you to God is by being His people being what he always called us to be. Exodus 19, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, living out his will. Or being walking billboards with God's grace written all over us. In other words, when we live a holy life, when we obey God's commandments, well then, then others will see, right? Others will see that, that God's grace is powerful and real. And that, as Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 4, the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talk, but of power. And so we obediently and in a responsive, grateful way obey God's law to say thank you for what he has done for us in Christ. But some other things happen, I think, too. And so I've added two more things we haven't talked about yet. One, when you look at your life and you're able to say, you know, I am different than I was before. You know, I, I don't speak quite the same way, and certainly my value systems are different. That impacts the way that I, I think, even about life, and my conduct has changed quite a bit since I've become a follower of Jesus Christ. In other words, when you see yourself obeying the law, well, that will, as the Catechism says, that will assure you that you are a Christian. You're assured that your faith is genuine and real, and that you're you're bearing the fruit of the Christian life. And that's another positive experience of the law. Right? You obey the law and you positively are reassured that um, well, all is well with you and your soul. Right? That God's grace is indeed proving itself, is giving evidence of itself in your life. But the third thing I want to mention is something that, that will tie in with what we've talked about earlier in this course especially in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 12. Maybe you remember the article on discipleship and the theme of holiness we talked about in those classes. And I hope that you would also see that our ability under the new covenant to obey the law is then a fulfillment of what was prophesied under the old covenant. Or to say it differently, what's new about the new covenant is not God's will for our life. That's always stayed the same. Right? That's Exodus 19 again. Kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God's demand for holiness hasn't changed. What's changed is our ability to meet that demand. And what the prophets prophesied about, what they foretold. I'm thinking about Isaiah. I'm thinking about Ezekiel. I'm thinking about um, a Jeremiah. They talked about a new covenant. They talked about a new day when God would pour out His Spirit. And the Spirit, then, is the power. The Spirit is the strength we have and need under the New Covenant to what? To no longer walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The Spirit is the power by which we obey God's law. And so when we obey God's law, we should say to ourselves, Oh, that's not because I'm so gifted. That's, that didn't happen because, um, you know, I, I learned what to do. No, that happened because God's Spirit, the promised Spirit by the prophets in the Old Covenant, God's Spirit has come. And unlike the Old Covenant, where God's Spirit was there too, but only on a certain very small group of people, and only for a limited time, and thereby the Spirit would not only come for a while, but also leave, what's new in the new is that the Spirit comes upon all those who are members of God's covenant people. And the Spirit doesn't come for a while and leave again. No, the Spirit comes and stays. And that's one of the hope, that's one of the good news of the gospel that, uh, that, that we have for ourselves and for those to whom we are privileged to minister. Namely, that we're not stuck forever in our sins. We're not doomed to perpetual failure. But under the new covenant, right, we have been blessed with Pentecost. We have been blessed with the presence and power of Christ's Spirit by which we can obey God's law.
Phew. This discussion on Paul and the law has been a long one because, well, it's complicated and there are conclusions that are not always the most orthodox or the easiest to see. But I do hope that this long and uh, detailed presentation, these series of discussions on Paul and the law, has helped you to see that the Apostle Paul does have a coherent theology of the law and how when you think carefully about the law, it can be very effective for you in your preaching and your future ministry.